At this point, I think after Halloween ends, what would be really cool is that they reboot it where, like, Halloween 6 officially would, like, be rebooted and you bring back Danielle again one more time. I know everyone's pushing for it at least make a cameo in the last one. Fuck that. Give her her... Give her a trilogy. She deserves that fucking trilogy. I'm over here wanting just Tom Atkins to pop up to make a, yeah. make Halloween, the new trilogy, make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then Tom Atkins rolls up with a beer and a cigarette. Yeah. I told you, fucker. <laughs> everybody and welcome back to another episode of Jeff and Colin in the morning. We are your hosts, Colin Peters. And John Rashutter. What? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Manfred as always. I was going to say, did I Freudian slip something here? <laughs> I think it's been a while, so I don't get to yell at him as much. So oh, that's, just yeah. Like, well, I feel like that's why Crappy every time schedules. we... What? <laughs> Crappy schedules. Yeah. yeah. It's like when we do finally get him, I just feel like I have to hit him harder. <laughs> That's our John. <laughs> but, I mean, if we could physically show everybody our uh, text message groups, there's times I just go in to rile them up and then stop talking. <laughs> but to be fair, when life does hit and we're just like, okay, <laughs> we yeah. stop and then we say, is there anything we can do? <laughs> so like, well, everything that everybody hears on the show and what they know about us, we joke around, we prod and poke at each other, but at the end of the day, we're, we got each other's backs. So, we just hope Absolutely. you all enjoy, <laughs> and we really don't hate each other on <laughs> No. It's just more fun in games. We're like the NWO of podcasts. We come in, we raise hell, <laughs> and we take over. That's about right. Pro wrestling, which hopefully we're going to talk about more sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best eras that we ever had of pro wrestling was during our generation. I know, dude, the Attitude Era. Woo! <laughs> We still had some of that late 80s, early 90s WWF stuff trickling down. Then we went into the new generation. I mean, even the Monday Night War was actually a good mm-hmm. thing. That. How the hell could we forget that? Whew. Man, what a time. That was good shit. It was. Now I feel old as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> if there's any big time capsule for us, it's definitely watching pro wrestling because they definitely knew how to move with the times and how we just... We're glued to Monday nights <laughs> for that stuff. Yeah. But, but man, what a ride. They don't make those guys like they used to anymore. I mean, I mean, it's still fun, but it's not what it used to be. No. I think the closest, I think the closest I've gotten to actually enjoying it again was AEW. And they have some of the older guys still yeah, on Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> <sighs> but as much as I'd love to talk about pro wrestling, that's for another time. Today, Jeff brought up an interesting topic, and it's a pretty fun one, actually. It's how horror movies and heavy metal music go hand in hand. Let me ask you, Jeff, what exactly was it that made you come up with this idea? Well, if you follow me on Instagram, my daughter is uh, choosing a record every week, so I'm introducing new music to her. And it wasn't until this past weekend when I put on um, Alice Cooper's Welcome to My Nightmare that I realized that heavy metal and horror go hand in hand more than I thought. Because when the song um, Only Women Bleed came on, my brain just instantly goes to Rob Zombie's Halloween. And I was like, so I started looking into it a little more, and I realized that it's always been there. It's just, um, I don't think we all realize it until you actually look for it. So take, for instance, like Alice Cooper being in several horror movies himself, but also making the music for it. Too. So the biggest one we all know is the man behind the mask. Friday, Friday the 13th, 13. part six, Jason lives. Yes. But it's like, it was kind of a cool thing, like looking into it just a little bit. Cause like, if I look into it, I'd be here all day. Just like, well, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny fact is I actually heard Ozzy Osbourne tell this story that when he, formed, uh, I don't know if he particularly formed black Sabbath or if it was Iomi and geezer Butler, but the guys of Black Sabbath, when they first got together and they were talking about what to name the band and what kind of music they were going to write, I think Ozzy was the one who said it was Tony Iommi that said that, uh, 
you know, all these people pay all this money for horror films. You know, why don't we make music that scares people? And that was actually how Black Sabbath came about. It wasn't that they were devil worshippers or anything like this. They wanted to try this gimmick in, in music where it was, hey, let's take the music as a horror genre and then we project that. And that's how they came up with the whole like scary heavy metal horror music in general. Because before horror and heavy metal came together, we had bands that were basically like what people know now as the Marilyn Mansons of that time, or I don't know, Slipknots or like whatever newer generations can associate. I don't even follow music anymore because honestly, I think a lot of today's music fucking sucks. So I don't really know like more modern bands to compare to for younger people, but you know, black hole. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but you know what? We still had the better shit than the newer. So, Hey, they might have youth, but we grew up with the good shit. But there were bands, like I said, Black Sabbath that started it. Alice Cooper was another one that started it. He wasn't really so into the real scary stuff, I would say, until Welcome to My Nightmare probably came out. And I don't believe that it was until most of the guys who were originally in the Alice Cooper band had left. And I I could be wrong about that. It's been a while since I followed his biography. But basically, when it was just him and not the original guys, that's when he kind of went more for the horror theme. And I think it was that tour where he broke out the snake and did more of the guillotine and theatrics on stage. And then even Kiss was another band that had, you know, the like horror elements because of Gene Simmons being the demon and spitting the blood, breathing the fire. And they wanted to be more of a heavy metal-esque kind of band. I'd probably say, like, their heaviest song is probably God of Thunder. has more of, like, that bass-driven oh, hard rock beat. Well, it's even at the very beginning of Rob Zombie's Halloween. That's how it kicks into the movie. I'd even argue that, in some ways... I mean, obviously not to, like, the extreme examples as Cooper, Sabbath, and Kiss, but I would say even uh, Deep Purple and Rainbow kind of had that going for themselves especially when Richie Blackmore formed Rainbow because he had Ronnie James Dio and then we all know that Dio went on and was a lead singer for Black Sabbath and became his own success in his solo band Dio and of course he made the Maloik famous absolutely you know it was this like devil horn symbol but really it's uh Italian for a protection I believe where if you do this and then you point to somebody it's to protect you from evil rather than give evil and also the devil mascot that dio always had on his albums that people always found scary and intimidating his name's murray (laughs) (laughs) i i can see that yeah (laughs) And, and of course with those bands we got a plethora of influences then throughout the years and heavy metal became it, it evolved you know we had bands like metallica and you know they're uh, should I say sister band Megadeth? Yeah, because or... I feel like it was a spite thing that Megadeth got made. Yeah. Like, you kicked me out, well, I'm going to make one better. <laughs> but, I mean, even around that time, you've got a lot that came out that was really hard, really heavy. Like, you said Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer. Even Anthrax had that. And it's like... Scott Ian was a big fan of Kiss. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he's a big horror fan, too. Uh, so is Kurt Hammett. And then you're seeing these people who are influenced by Alice Cooper and um, Dio and Sabbath and everybody now starting to make their bands. And they're trying to um, kind of move forward doing their own thing, but yet you can still see the influences throughout the whole thing. Absolutely. Um, I want to say, like, the one album that always stuck out besides Welcome to a Nightmare for Alice Cooper was uh, Alice Cooper Goes to Hell. Because of it telling the story of a guy dealing with all the bullshit, the addiction, and then t- literally talking to the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Why I'm here. I remember Bob Dylan saying that nobody really gave Alice Cooper the credit for writing a song as good as and as fast and talented as he was. And I think people really underestimated how good Alice Cooper was at writing a song. And I remember in his podcast he said he there's only so many things that he can be really good at but he can write a song in two minutes oh wow yeah (laughs) 
I mean, he's what, 20 albums deep right now? <laughs> Keep them coming. Dude, I, I have yet to hear one that's totally trash. Like, yeah, you get a couple songs like, eh, but as a whole, it's still a solid album. I haven't heard anything bad from him. I mean, you and I, we've seen Alice Cooper out like 10 plus times or whatever. I know, I've lost count. Because, like, <laughs> it seems like after a while, it's just like, oh, Alice Cooper's coming around? Fuck right. Fuck yeah, dude, you know, it's always a good time. Yeah, yeah even like even if it's, it sucks, it's not going to suck. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, that's the worst time I probably saw him. And it's like, well, if that's the worst time, hey, so be it. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, that, that's just Cooper, man. Same with Kiss. It's like, you know, I've never seen a bad Kiss show ever. I mean, say what you will about their albums or their personalities or the tension in the band. But, man, when you see them live... Pfft, it feels like they leave everything at the door and, like, the show's the show. Once they step off stage, who cares? It's like, what they're there, I'm fine with that. It's kind of like when people say there's work you and then there's home you. Yeah. You know, when you, somebody says, oh, yeah, he's a real fucking prick to work for, but at home, he's an awesome guy. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's just the way it is. You know, and they're also playing characters. Like, Alice Cooper had said for the longest time that his name was Vincent Fernier. And that the name of the band was just something that they just came up with. They said, why don't you name the band Alice Cooper? And there was nobody named Alice in the band. It was just people were coming up to Alice and saying, yo, Alice, you rock tonight. And he's like, who, me? <laughs> and it's also a humble thing, too. Mm -hmm. I think being the lead singer, you just naturally associate with it like that. And I mean, you know, then it became a... Like a like wait his name's Alice but he's a guy, <laughs> it's just like that, the joke in that Dark Shadows movie by Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. The Cooper woman. The Cooper woman. That's the ugliest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> like they, he like he didn't expect to have that moniker. No. It just happened, and then he said it was a character, and it was so funny. I got this really funny story about Alice Cooper. There is a DVD or Blu-ray out there of him from the Welcome to My Nightmare tour originally. And there was bonus features and he talks about how he has some like, like pre-stage ritual where he watches bad kung fu movies. And I think he has Skittles and it has to be kung fu movies that he's never seen before. Oh, wow. The one time we went out to Lehigh Valley here in Pennsylvania and my dad and I saw him at Music Fest. I think I, were, I think we were just killing time before we actually got to the actual event. The Lehigh Valley Mall was close by, and there was a bus to shuttle us over to the the actual festival. And so we were just walking around the mall, and we saw that there was a sale on DVDs and other things like that. And my dad had passed on them at the time, and then he said, you know, let's go back to the mall and. I wouldn't mind having those and adding them to my collection. So we went back and we bought the Welcome to My Nightmare DVD. And the lady at the counter said, oh, he was just in here like a day or two ago. He bought a couple kung fu movies. <laughs> oh, my God. And we were like, holy shit. Because we had rented it through Netflix and had seen the commentary before. And we said, boy, isn't this irony? Because it's in this DVD where he talked about, I have to watch bad kung fu movies that I've never seen before. Before I go out on stage. <laughs> yeah. It's cool seeing like people's rituals uh, doing it. But if that's what he needs to get to what we see, absolutely. Well, he'll put you to the challenge with bad movies. <laughs> oh my gosh. I feel like he should get a certificate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he'll probably have some obscure, like from what, 40 years of <laughs> the shows that, I mean, just shit, just the shows we've seen alone. It's like. How many has this guy fucking seen? <laughs> yeah. It makes me wonder if he buys like a giant box set and is like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess he has to watch them once. I don't know. If he wants something that bad, he can watch uh, Joss Whedon's Justice League. That'll get you in the mood. Also with him, it was cool seeing him kind of do the um, transition from music into movies. So we saw him in uh, Dark Prince as a hobo. <laughs> yeah. It's a John Carpenter movie. Yeah, and then uh, I know definitely again we've talked about before was the Nightmare on Elm Street Final Nightmare, Freddy's Dead. Yeah, and yeah. that was cool seeing him play the kind of drunk dad. And you know when people hear that they think, oh man, Alice Cooper play, played Freddy Krueger's dad, and it's like, but it's not really his dad. It's a foster dad. Yeah. You know, like when you hear Alice Cooper being the dad, you're thinking, oh, he's the main 
you know, vessel of the seed that created the Freddy Krueger for the Son of a Hunter Maniac? No. Just a guy... Just, just... a drunk, abusive foster father. <laughs> That's like, ah, uh, missed opportunity there. <laughs> yeah. Bummer. And then, uh, I know he did a recent one. I think it's called Suck. But it's, uh, a, I think he plays a vampire, or is dealing with vampires. And he's more or less kind of, like, in the background. But I love the fact that they put him as the forefront. Like, no, come on. <laughs> and obviously Dark Shadows. No, like... yeah, dude. Dark Shadows, I think that was probably one of the funniest cameos. Because when they were talking about it in the movie, I did not expect to actually see Alice Cooper in the movie. And they said those were all the original Alice Cooper band guys, too. Oh, that's awesome. I think they had just gotten inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it was all the originals and... When they were doing that movie, obviously it takes place in the early 70s, so they said that they got all the original guys back. But I don't think he actually tours with them anymore. I think it's pretty much newer people with them. And then kind of seeing the transition from the horror movies that we also got, Man Behind the Mask. And I actually love the video for that song. <laughs> <laughs> it is really funny. It's a music video where you see a dad sitting behind the chair and he's talking to his son whose name is Jason. And he's getting ready to go on a date with his girlfriend. And I think he says, what, he's going to take her out to the movies. They show the Friday the 13th clips. And they show Alice Cooper on stage. And Jason breaks through the screen. And Alice Cooper takes off the hockey mask. The dad says to the son, how did your night go? And he goes, well, the movie was a little complicated with the plot. And the dad turns the chair around. Here, it's Alice Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. But I I could be wrong about this, but I believe that was the first, at least, mainstream rocker to do a song for a horror movie. Friday 6 came out in 86, I think? Yeah, came out in 86. Not, one didn't come out in 87. 88 was New Blood, and 89 was Manhattan. So it had to be 86. And of course, the most famous one of all, and we'll talk about it a little more, was Dokken for Dream Warriors. So I think Alice Cooper was the very first one, at least that I know of, that did heavy metal for a horror movie. And now I feel like it's a common thing, like, because they go hand in hand. <laughs> well, remember the end song at Nightmare on Elm Street? That, like, synthesized pop song that's so bad, you're just like, man, this does not fit with the movie at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. I'm trying to think of, like, a lot of those early horror movies, they really didn't have any sort of... I mean, I guess you could argue that in the first Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween, they played Blue Oyster Cult. That was kind of... I mean, they were hard rock at the time and kind of, I mean, obviously, like, Don't Fear the Reaper is, you can associate with Halloween, but it wasn't really so in your face. They just kind of played it more, like, in the radio while they were in a car. Yeah, it was like a little, like, snippet, not like as in a full song or... Full, in your face yeah. or end credits, you know? Like, I know Man Behind the Mask in Friday 6 was on a boom box and wherever you you went it wasn't throughout the whole movie but like when the kids were setting up the camp you heard it at the end credits you heard it i think there was another spot in the movie where you heard it as well, well but you know, they had feed my frankenstein in there too they did yes uh, at the camper you know they, it was another alice cooper song hard rock summer was another one when there was the chase scene when oh, the cops were that. chasing uh uh megan and tommy so yeah, the, you had three songs from Alice Cooper in that one movie, and then you had some 80s music in there as well. And it's kind of cool seeing that like nice transition, and like you said, Dawkins was in <laughs> Dream Warriors. Well, yeah, they did the Dream Warriors. Thing. For Nightmare on Elm Street 3, yep. And I think they said that it Dawkins' Dream Warriors music video was actually at the end of the credits, so on the VHS. So oh, okay. if you watched all of Nightmare on Elm Street, it was like a bonus feature that the video was on there at the very end. And I think they said that 
it went gold and everybody or platinum I, I think it was gold like the song was such a big hit it went gold and they got those specialty records to commemorate it and i think even the producers got gold like a gold record to say like hey nightmare on old street three we got a hit song on here <laughs> that's funny and that song kicks ass too i should say it's appropriate for those characters too because it's like a kick-ass come together kind of song like you know they talk about the dream warriors and it's just rocking and and you think of those characters in that movie coming together trying to fight freddy it was so cool and that song just like, kicks ass <laughs> and Dawkins known for being one of those 80s hair metal bands more but that song was i always said to my dad i felt like out of a lot of those 80s hair bands that were obvious 80s hair metal bands I felt like Dokken had more substance than most. Like, a lot of their songs were more effort into them, I should say, than somebody like Poison or Rat. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I know people shit on those bands, but their music is fun. It's like, okay, they're not, like, the most classic of classic things, but shit, man, you can put that stuff on at a party and still have a good time. Yeah, so I'm just laughing at the names. So I feel, oh, some of them are so dude, bad. Jackal, Rat, <laughs> Great White. <laughs> po like, Poison Alone, I'm like, all right, I expect a heavier sound. No, no. No, no, like, in the first album, it's like, man, look at these chicks. And they're like, no, those are dudes. It's like, what? <laughs> Warrant? No, that was another one. Oh, uh, shit, even Twisted Sister. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, they... Also, D. Snyder did a horror movie. He, yes, he did. He was in Strangeland. Yeah. And he played the character, the main villain, Captain Howdy. Yeah. Which is a Twisted Sister song, Captain Howdy. And it's kind of crazy. Like, like the, as of, like we're talking about this, my brain's just constantly just going. Like, that's where, when you, I made the connection to Twisted yeah. Sister. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's a lot of stuff that I felt like the 80s, both 70s and 80s, music and movies influenced a lot of bands today so like as we're going through here talking about it and tw we got a twisted sister i'm sorry <laughs> but um i feel like all that and has influenced like we eventually got rob zombie and white zombie and you could see definitely that the horror element was there like oh absolutely i even think that not just in horror movies but say like dark action movies or even sci-fi started adopting the heavy metal theme like guns and roses did uh you could be mine for terminator 2 even though technically it was already a pre-recorded song but use your illusion 2 wasn't out yet and i think it was just a way to promote guns and roses and have music in it but then it became a thing because that music video was like a a big deal you saw clips of terminator 2 which was a highly anticipated movie it was sci-fi with some horror elements. I mean, because we've talked about how first Terminator is like 80 slasher with, you know, in a sci-fi movie. And then Terminator 2, even though it was like more action, the T-1000 still had that 80 slasher oh my villain to him as well. But people don't see it because it's not dark and gritty horror. But there is that suspense and the sci-fi is more in your face than the actual horror itself. But... Yeah, Terminator had Guns N' Roses associated with it. And then, um, I can't really say there were too many well-known or well-liked songs on the soundtrack to The Crow, but that had, like, a lot of, like, Henry Rollins band, Stone Temple Pilots, some other underground bands that you don't really uh, know about. Nine Inch Nails, I think, was on there. Yep, that was another one. They were even in the movie. Yeah. I mean, like, not like the song was, not the band themselves. And uh, White Zombie was on the soundtrack to The Crow City of Angels. I remember that soundtrack was a bit of a big deal. You had them, you had uh, Hole, they were another one. Oh, man, I forget so many of them. But I remember The Crow and The Crow City of Angels had some pretty kick-ass soundtracks to them, and they were, like, the heavy metal and the new horror guys and shit like that. So it was carrying even into this action genre as well. And if, like, the action wasn't, say, like a Rambo movie, but it was more uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger's End of Days, that was another oh. one that had, you know, like, 
horror and religious backgrounds and then i think guns and roses was back for that and you had some more modern bands on there like limp biscuit you know because they were popular at the time i mean i definitely wasn't a limp biscuit fan but they were on there i think eminem was even on yeah. that for fuck's sake <laughs> i mean i feel like the um 90s to like early 2000s you had those soundtracks that were all like heavy metal based like the one that always sticks out to me i'm gonna laugh is actually the ben affleck daredevil one because i had a lot of really good ones yeah it did i remember we used to listen to that and talk about it quite a bit i think um, fuel was on there and they had a real kick-ass song yeah that started the whole soundtrack off and it was like holy fuck man i mean that it like those soundtracks i wish they would still do and because you introduce you to new bands, even though it might be one song, you might go, oh, cool. Let me go check out this over here. Uh, same thing with Freddy vs. Jason. You had a lot on there that was more of the heavier aspects. It, that was, like, super heavy. Like that, as they say, Cooking Monster vocals where it's like... <laughs> I don't get into that. I, I listen to it, and I'm just like, every song sounds the same. I can't understand anything they're saying. There's no melody and harmony to it. That just does not interest me at all. <laughs> Couldn't get into it. Nope. <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> yeah. But I always laugh, because like, even talking about horror, all I could think about, as soon as we brought it up, was Little Nicky, because of the whole like heaven and hell thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was another one. All heavy, Almost all heavy metal, but like very sprinkled through was just lighter bands. But yeah. I feel like the 90s were the ones that really were like, all right, let's pump it up. Like, the 80s were the start of it, and the 90s kind of, like, shoved it in there. It was like an experiment, in a way. Like, how is this going to take? Or was it a studio decision to say, hey, we can, like, put this and that person together? It was kind of like how Warner Brothers, I think, had Prince signed. Okay. And they said, well, we got Prince's music, so why don't we put him in Batman? Because, I mean, let's face it, Batman was a studio movie. That was made because they knew Superman made money. Of course they wanted it to be good, but there was, like, plug this, plug that. Let's make what we can to, like, just sell toys and other merchandise. And Batman became more substance than, I think, what they actually thought. Obviously, it's a classic. It's not just some throwaway. I think it's a bit of a cliche, you know... Like good versus bad guy and there is some mixed things in there that keeps it from being perfect but i mean i still love it for what it is because it's just one of my favorite movies and i think also watching it at a young age and not really getting too into the like this flaw versus that flaw and just thinking they just pretty much thought it's probably going to be one and done even though sequels were scattered here and there they didn't realize it would become a phenomenon yet and so so was, things with it aren't perfect, but Prince was used mainly because they just said, we have this connection, let's just use him, and then he'll sell more records, he'll sell more records for us, so you put Batman on it, hey, it's Prince and Batman, we'll do music videos for it, it markets the movie, it markets him, We'll sell, and then Danny Elfman has a soundtrack, so part of me is like, maybe somebody had some connection with Alice Cooper, and like, and I don't know how Docking came, became involved with Nightmare on Elm Street because, I mean, then they made a music video where Robert England and um, Patricia Arquette were actually in it. And it was kind of like a short movie in a way where Doc and the band were the actual Dream Warriors and they saved Patricia Arquette. That's actually pretty cool. It's been yeah. a while since I've watched that one, even though we've listened to it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> And then Robert England wakes up and goes, oh, what a nightmare. Who were those guys? And then I think there were, you can find these old MTV clips where it's Robert England in the Freddy makeup and costume. And he's talking with Doc and then they're doing like commercial promos or something like that. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. They are hilarious. He even says to him, like, hey, yo, you guys want to go out to the bar and try to pick up some girls later? <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it. It was another time between, like, the 80s and 90s where we got the, like I said, introduced, and I felt like they played everything all upon each other, where, like, music videos were part of selling the movie. Um, just gonna laugh. It's, uh, was it Scream 3 and Creed, What If? 
Oh, yeah. That was a big deal. I mean, just even the video for it showing, like, it was, felt like it was a trailer for Scream 3. So, kind of like one of those things, like, we used that media more then than we do now. Now, each, I guess, video, if they still exist, are just little movies. But before, it's like, they could have been a trailer, they could have just been them playing, and then here's a little bit of the movie. Creed also did a song for Halloween H2O. Oh, really? And Yeah, it, uh, What's This Life For? And you hear that through Halloween H2O as well. Uh, I think the mention films in a lot of those movies that they were doing had a lot of soundtracks that involved a lot of heavy metal type stuff. Like, I want to say when Halloween 6 came out, I don't remember some of the songs exactly in there, but there was a bit of a heavy metal score or some sort of, you know, combination of metal involved with it and... There was, you know, like the 90s were that transitional period where, you know, horror was dying, but yet action was still, like, guys like Arnold and Stallone were still on top of their game, even though they might have a movie that comes out that's bad, but still it was, they were marketable. And because that heavy metal transition was almost like testosterone, get you pumped, get, you know, it was like you could transition it to that suspense and that like feeling of trying to survive like you know like how they say you listen to music to get you pumped up at the gym and most of the time it's like a really kick-ass hard rock song like you know you could put on welcome to the jungle and just you know, like like yeah man i'm ready to bench press 250 you know or something i think it started having that feeling like it created a feeling it created a not a tension but a an adrenaline and it fit with the horror movie. Like, it fit with the suspenseful times. Like, you're going to kick the bad guy's ass. Um, it's not the greatest of the series, but in Nightmare on Elm Street 4, remember when Lisa Wilcox is getting ready to fight Freddy at the end because the boyfriend was in the car accident and he goes under in the surgical room? Yeah. And she's, like, gotten every dream power from everybody who died. And then she just starts combining them and then the heavy metal starts playing and she's like getting the leather jacket on putting the studs from her friend on and her brother's uh bandana from his martial arts and you and she's taking like she's taking off all the stuff that made her nerdy and an outcast and she's just like feeling confident in herself and she's not being afraid you know it gets you pumped oh uh, i was also thinking lost boys was another one where they used the heavy metal element that actually made the scene uh, take the instance for um, was it Aerosmith and Run DMC when they're um, around the fire. And all of a sudden, that, they're listening to it. All of a sudden, the, the vampires descend on the people and just start tearing them apart. While this music's playing, and it kind of like kind of set the tone. Like, oh, fuck, this is what it's really like. <laughs> I was like, think about it. I just thought about that when you were saying about the heavy metal gave a feeling. And granted, that's not like the heaviest song to be using, yeah. but it kind of like was enough just to uh, set the tone. <laughs> It's amazing how the music can tell a story like that. I mean, it's no different than an orchestra, like say in Rocky, when you hear "Gonna Fly Now," and you're and you think of him running up the stairs and doing the exercising. You know that it almost makes you want to be like, "Yeah, I'm I'm gonna do some push-ups right now," you know, <laughs> or uh, "Eye of the Tiger" or something. But it just fits because they're with metal and horror, and it's become this thing now where. Say, like, when we go out, we have a place there in uh, Sinking Spring in PA that has this uh, horror attraction called Shocktoberfest. And I remember one year, while you were waiting in line, they would have this guy who was breathing fire on one of the roofs of the pavilions, and they were playing montages of clips of horror movies while playing just heavy metal. Like, it just bands that just got you pumped. And there were scenes, like, one of the scenes that stuck out to me the most was fight scenes in blade oh yeah and i just felt like it fit and i know like in that movie it's mostly like club rave techno type stuff which even fits in that movie as well because a lot of that shit does take place in those underground club rave kind of environments you know yeah. like the vampires that's like where they hang out because it's night and it's their gathering and they you know, invite the humans in, and then they just feast the fuck out of them. <laughs> so, I get that, but it had, like, a... It, not, like, an 80s pop, but it was more 
in your face uh, adrenaline, I guess. Yeah. And it fit, but like even heavy metal just fit with it as well. Even some of the somber heavy metal bands and songs. Like I remember there was that show Lucifer. I think isn't it on Netflix now, or yeah. it's done, or what? Whatever. Either there was a show called Lucifer about the devil. <laughs> it's pretty obvious, but. I think there were a couple scenes where he's playing the piano, and one of the songs he was playing was Unforgiven by Metallica. And I forget what the situation, the scenario was, but I just remember it was just so cool hearing him play this song. And I think there were just all these things going on in the background, or that had previously happened, that the song title is Unforgiven, so I think that's basically what... The message here was like no matter what you do you're not going to be forgiven and yeah. you're talking about lucifer here so it's like yeah you know that's <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> that's actually really fitting kind of a, a uh, almost an irony concept yeah sorry you just kind of like made a moment I'm <laughs> like, oh, um but yeah like as you're pointing out like even the somber stuff it just really does fit like uh, or having orchestras, orchestras play something heavy, but it still is an orchestra sounding thing over top of something. I'm trying to remember an instance. Like I remember hearing one where they just started playing something like that's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it it is kind of cool, like seeing where they can use the music itself to play along with the movie. So you brought up Terminator when um they play the uh, Guns N' Roses song. It actually starts playing as they're driving off, so it fits the scene and it's like it more or less is giving that little bit of an aspect of here it's a little bit heavier we're going to go from there um i'm trying to think right off the top of my head there's really not yeah. <laughs> um i just recently watched that Foo fighters movie studio 666 and this is kind of funny because they knew what they were doing they just did it for fun but you talked about a piano uh dave Grohl's having writer's block so he starts singing hello from uh lana ritchie well, Lionel Richie's ghost shows up and tells him to fucking stop it. That's his song. <laughs> <laughs> but even in that movie, they had a lot of... Um, Wait, Lionel Richie's ghost? Yeah, because he... He's dead? No. <laughs> oh, okay. It was just like, more or less like, Dave Grohl's in a haunted house. And it just happened to be like, you see smoke start welling in. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Lionel Richie's like, you know what? Don't play my fucking song. That's my favorite song. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> but it, it, made, it made for a funny moment because like, yeah, dude... Dave Grohl's got writer's block. It's been 10 albums. They're trying to work it out. But they made this movie because I felt like they do have writer's block, and it was just kind of a fun thing to do. They wrote a black metal song for this movie, and it sounds amazing. I want to hear it the whole thing through, but they said it's about 45 minutes long. Holy fuck. That's what I said. They're, like, talking about making it throughout the movie, and, like, they're doing – you're getting to hear, like, maybe 30 seconds at a shot because they're recording it. And I'm like – as you're hearing it, I'm like, I kind of want to hear the rest of it. <laughs> Jeez, the new – Iron Butterfly in Agata De Vita. Yeah. <laughs> Holy hell. But it they also have brought in Carrie King from Slayer. He plays a roadie who gets killed. He ends up playing a demon. But it's like it's stuff like that, like where horror and metal are always gonna intertwine. And like I said, just because I was recently I just watching it was what made me think of it. <laughs> but it it's always gonna be there. Uh come on. Even Tenacious D for fuck's sake, they fucking <laughs> <laughs> they do some of the funniest dumb shit but yet it still goes back to like let's throw the devil in here and make it scary <laughs> i think it's going to be synonymous with at this point and in some ways it's it's got this like weird irony that there's this sexual like beauty to it i think a perfect example of it actually is in the batman the new matt reeves uh, robert pattinson movie it's built more around it being a horror film which i like and also murder mystery suspense sort of thing and then they played nirvana something in the way and i think in the movie they give you the original version of something in the way and then in the original trailer they remixed it to this like really gothic more melodic uh remix i guess is the best way to say it and they also added a little more echo or chants to it almost making it kind of like choir type like when they do the something in the way it's not just him singing but in the trailer like when the 
the letters of the Batman, they like really elevate the the music and uh, Kurt Cobain's voice to make it more dramatic, and you you really feel it in that first trailer. And in the movie, when you they play it a couple times in the movie, and I remember the one time is when he's riding a motorcycle towards the beginning of the movie, and he's going back to the Batcave, I believe, and he's narrating gotham city and life in the second year and if he's making a difference and it's fitting because the villains and the corruption are what's in his way and he's trying to make a difference and he's like no, i don't know if i am or not but it's like they're in the way of something good but he's in the way of them making things worse so it's like ah and it's nothing's like super escalated at this point it's just it's just crime i mean crime no matter what is bad but it's just low-level crime that is what it is and then it's not until the end of the movie when riddler i'm not gonna say i wanted to well, say it, it but escalates it the escalates the master plan and batman saves the day which holy Eddie, shit batman sh saves the yeah day. i know right <laughs> shocker there and, <laughs> and then they start playing it and people start seeing batman as not as this horror element anymore but as a hero a little bit and then the something in the way not in the way that we know is in the trailer that builds that dramatic effect but this like almost calming this ease like what you were scared of him before it's okay now because there's at one point where people are actually going to him when before they were like oh don't hurt me don't hurt me and now they're like no he thank you you know yeah is which i thought was really cool it was really neat to see and how again the music play an effect and something in the way is not this heavy metal song but there's something dark to it like a lot of Soundgarden songs some of them may not be the most in your face hard rock songs but man some of those lyrics are dark and the melody can just fit in this you can just chill and relax but if you get too into it it can be dark yeah you know, like Like a Stone, you hear Like a Stone and you go, man, this is a really cool song. But when you dive deep into the lyrics, it's about a guy waiting to die. Yeah. I already thought about it like that. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> so like, it's almost as like the most pop sounding song could be about the darkest shit. And it's a lot of stuff I listen to that's heavy. But if you listen to the lyrics, it's the most positive stuff. It just sounds so evil. <laughs> Sometimes it makes me laugh when I hear these like heavy metal ballads. And they're like, oh, I love you! <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> but <laughs> but I also I also feel that like even though like we're saying that uh, metal and horror go hand in hand, I feel like metal also influenced a lot of these bands. So uh, as we're talking you about, you mean horror influence these yeah, bands? Yeah. Did I say metal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same difference. It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, like I think that's where we originally would we've gotten um, I almost said Alice Cooper, but uh, uh, Rob Zombie obviously we've gotten Slipknot because of it. we've got Manson because of it. Um, even in the newer bands that we're recently now starting to see, like we um, Ghost who recently just did a song for Halloween Kills, you can see a lot of that horror element, but they're very theatrical on their show. All right, uh, Ice Nine Kills is another one that I've brought up. I know our good friend. Jen Harding really likes too. They've done two full albums now of just songs about horror movies. And it's just cool seeing like them being fans and then doing a song to do it. Recently, the one that I always laugh about is called the your numbers up. It's not even on the original album. It's a, uh, a bonus song that later came out. It's actually about scream. And it's actually my favorite song from the album because like you actually, you're getting the story of what happened in the first movie without being blatantly obvious about it. Oh, Okay. Um, the newest one that I actually enjoy is called Ex Mortis, and it's literally telling the story of Evil Dead. But nice. It's, it's kind of cool hearing a fan taking a new perspective on a story. We've heard hundreds of times. So um, I think even Motionless and White has a couple songs that deal with it. I know they have one for Edward Scissorhands, but like I said, it's a heavier song, so you're not going to catch it right off the bat. And I know definitely Wednesday 13 is another big one. Kind of a weird dude, but he does do a lot of the horror-esque stuff he was also in the band murder dolls with joey jordanson from slipknot appropriate yeah so it's like kind of cool seeing all that but 
it's like you can see where the horror and the metal have now intertwined to make almost a whole new thing. <laughs> and anything dark, you know, it seems like it's appropriate and fitting. Like, hasn't, um, didn't John 5 do something with the Batman Arkham games? Or. I know he actually does write music outside of, like, his band and Zombies Band. Um, I know he did a lot of the uh, actual work, like, music work for uh, Lords of Salem. So it's like. You get, like, really eerie stuff. I think he was working with Tyler Bates, who does a lot of, like, the horror movies. Yes. And you can hear, like, John Five's little touches just throughout the whole thing. It's he Dude's really talented. It's kind of crazy. There's another musician. His name's Junkie XL. I think he's done a lot of work on, especially, like, Batman versus Superman. And, of course, these movies have evolved, and the music has evolved, so... What we know now may not be the same. I haven't seen too many of the newer horror films that have adopted the newer bands it's mostly older music and if there is newer music there is a side soundtrack to it and then a lot of the music doesn't feel like it fits no i mean even if they are reusing music from the 80s and 90s it seems like somebody's remaking it for the remake <laughs> well look at rob zombie's halloween i mean that was loaded with blue oyster cult uh peter frampton was even in it Kiss was in it. Alice Cooper. You know? Yeah. I mean, plus, Rob Zombie just grew up on bands like that anyway. I mean, like, going back to Freddy vs. Jason, like a lot of the songs on that soundtrack just wouldn't fit with the movie. You know, you had, what, maybe two songs, and it's not like they were really <coughs> in the, the motion picture part. I think you had the, the very beginning when the titles came on, and then you had the... Uh, end credits and i thought that fit i think there was a little bit of like the fighting but it was more orchestral anyway yeah i feel like the songs on the soundtrack were probably used throughout the movie but it might have been like a clip so like you know a little bit of a guitar here a little bit of this here which i mean i know you and i we love that movie it's not for everybody but it i i just can't see that movie being any different and i i'm glad they didn't have too much of that music in it because I also wasn't impressed with that soundtrack at all anyway. Is there one movie you would say that you would wa remake or not remake? Redo the soundtrack to, but adding something more heavy to it. Hmm. The whole soundtrack? I mean, just even adding a few songs just to see if it would change the whole like outcome of a movie. I'd have to think about it because... I mean, sometimes, you know, there's there are songs that are good for, like, period pieces. Like, Captain Marvel had a lot of the 90s music, and that really fit in with it. But I'm trying to... I think maybe if, like, they would... If you put some music in a bad movie, it might help it out a little bit and change the mood. But I... None's really popping in my head right away. Um... I mean, I'd have to go back on this because it's. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know. I mean, like, I never really thought of it. Like, oh man, if they would have added this song or this kind of music for, for this scene or that scene. Like, honestly, maybe. I think the whole movie would have to be changed differently, but probably Blair Witch Project, because there's absolutely nothing there. But you know, that's such a split dynamic where. People either love it because you don't see anything and it's all the psychological in your mind sort of stuff versus other people who say there's nothing in it. So some people may love it that it's like that. You know, I think it could benefit from from things like that, but I also think they just fucked that franchise and up entirely. <laughs> Like, off the top of my head, there's not really a movie that I know of where I'd say, yeah, they should have added this or that. Not not that I can think of. I don't know. What do you got over there? <laughs> <laughs> As I'm looking at Jeff's collection. I mean, like, I think of my... Right away, I go to my top two favorite movies, or my top favorite movies of, of all time. I mean... I love that in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I heard something different that I felt like fit 
the fit that genre and was a little bit more appealing to kids, even though like people complain that it was dark or whatever. Um, for as a hard rock guy as I am, I do enjoy Prince's music. So, I mean, when I listen, I mean, I, I own the Batman soundtrack, so, and I listen to it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I appreciate it. I mean, I, I appreciate anything that's good. I mean, I, there's a bunch of shit out there that I go, oh my God, what the fuck? But, I mean, I've, I've definitely heard songs that were out of place in movies that I'd be like, why did they put this song in here? But I can't think of one that comes to my head right away. And some movies I feel like, I think an orchestral score might be better than an actual song. So, um, do you have one? No, I was just curious to see, because like, having a lot of that stuff going through, I figured you would kind of have like an idea, but it's pretty much, um, like you said, the lack of music can wreck a moment or make a moment. And if it's too heavy, um, if it's going to actually, like I said, wreck a moment, it, I'm trying to think the one scene that I felt really benefited from a heavier soundtrack was, I'm always going to go back to this. It's going to be Rob Zombie's Halloween. The scene that always gets me, is actually uh, Motorhead's The Chase is Better Than The Catch when he is chasing Lori and then he flips the fucking car. And then that was a, a scene to me that that song fit and it was a heavier moment. Because, dude, he's a big dude flipping a car. So I was like, even the song itself fit the moment. So it's like, it, if you think about everything leading up to it and then the lyrics of the song going with it, it's perfect for what it was. But totally. other than that, like it's like... I know it's kind of a dying thing again, where they are putting more of the heavier stuff in. Like, you get it, like, every now and again, but it's not, like, a common thing anymore. No, I... I feel like we're so watered down with talent is, is a problem. Like, we, like, earlier, we were just talking about pro wrestling and how it's changed so much. I, I And part of me says a lot of it's because, like, the... Like, the mystique is gone. You know, it's before we were into, like, cartoon characters, comic book characters come to life, and they could be live in front of us and put on this I'm gonna beat you up show. And that's what it is. It's a show, and people don't give the guys that much credit for being as talented as they are and for being as safe and what they actually do for us for sheer entertainment and the punishment that their bodies go through. But, I mean, that's just... Like, if you don't want to hear it, that's just being ignorant. But now that mystique is gone. And, like, also, like, around the time when, like, the Batman Begins Nolan movies came out, we got in this sense of realism. Like, everything's got to be real. It's got to be so grounded. You know, like, like the pro wrestlers, you can't have that, like, if it's flashy, it's got to be more Hollywood-type flashy, not straight out of a comic book and, like, theatrical anymore. It's just kind of like what's designer i guess in a way you know, it's it kind of takes the fun out of it and the secrets of horror movies like the slasher is just kind of their form nostalgia more nothing's really super scary as it used to be and even no matter what kind of music you add to it it doesn't really do much and i think what i think the thing that's lived more as far as music goes in horror is more the orchestral scores. You know, obviously Friday the 13th has the... Nightmare on Elm Street has the piano. Halloween's a big one. Exorcist is a big one. I think them creating that created... Like, if Halloween had a face with music, it would be that theme, is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, if you click on... A Freddy Krueger picture, you'll hear the piano playing if it says, like, listen to the music by clicking here. You know, it wouldn't necessarily be docking. <laughs> but you do make the correlation, though. Yes. I mean, even as much as I said that it's really great that Terminator has Guns N' Roses and you could be mine associated with it, I think you're still going to think of the main Terminator theme. That oh, boom, absolutely. Boom, 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 boom. I think, like, the bands are really just secondary into it. Now, something like, this is not heavy metal related, but 
some TV shows have themes that you associate with them, like Cheap Trick did that 70s show theme. You know, that's easy to associate with it, but it's not like there's an orchestral score because it's it's a comedy sitcom, so you're not going to get that element with it. Other than that, I, I don't really know where it's going to go, and so many bands are just coming and going with labels, and I've heard... Um, What's the lead singer of Smashing Pumpkins? Oh. Billy Corgan. I've heard him talk about how that the music industry has become such a business now where you get signed to a contract and they make it sound like you're the diamond in the rough, you're the great you're the needle in the haystack we were looking for, and they'll help push you and make you famous, and then by a year or two they're just they move on and find somebody else. And they could sound exactly the same and say, oh, you're the best thing ever. And then they're like, well, yeah, two years ago you were great, but, you know, you're still contracted to give us an album and then you just do this and you know, later kind of thing. So then we just get a plethora of all these new people and it's like, what are they giving to us, really? I think that's another reason why I don't get into, you know, like newer music anymore. I just, because I don't, I don't hear it. I don't hear anything that good anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of musicians just after they hit their their fame and fortune they just don't care and these newer guys are looking for that big break but MTV's not the way it used to be music video promotion's not what it used to be I think they have to pay for their own music videos now and really the only way to see them is on YouTube and it seems like a lot more bands are starting to be their own label instead of having a bigger company control it so and and now with the the massive censorship that we got i mean you know just like comics you know they're having a hard time figuring out what to say and how to go about things so i can only imagine what some musicians are going through like will this go mainstream will this make you money and like how long are you going to be struggling by making the music that you want versus what's going to make you money. Because, I mean, let's face it, pops is what really sells nowadays. Oh, it's always. Yeah, it's and it's going to be that way. I mean, the 80s really, like, put that into perspective. I mean, you can put that in anywhere, really, and it, and it just fits. You know, it can get your adrenaline going. You can do ballads to it. You can play it at weddings and, you know, clubs or wherever. You know, you can do remixes that aren't even necessarily like the hit song, but you can change it up to make it more appropriate for that setting. So it's, I don't know. Talking about my talking about weddings. Come on, I was probably one of the few weddings you've been to that actually played some metal. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got some things like Rocky Horror Picture Show, where the music just—I mean, it's a musical based yeah. around the music, and it just fits and tells the story throughout the whole thing <laughs> yeah but it also a lot of it even though it was a popular sound did have some heavy metal elements to it oh for sure uh, time warp and i want to say meatloaf song had a little bit of a heavy metal feel to it oh for that time yeah i mean they were riffing more on like the 1950s like rock kind of thing or like the elvis type of rock with that because that's what he was modeling off of but yeah no that was definitely i mean you Especially, like, even some of the newer versions of like, Rocky Horror now, so if you see it live, they kind of jazz it up a little bit, make it more more rockin'. I've seen Rocky Horror live where they do live bands instead of just play, like, a soundtrack and they sing over it or something like that. And that's what's really cool. I actually prefer it that way, where it's a live band. Not Same. A... Well, do you have a soundtrack that will always stick out to you? I have a couple, actually. Well, then let's hear them. Oh, I got. I think I already mentioned a couple. The Crow, and the Crow City Angels. It's not really a soundtrack, but uh, Alice Cooper's Constrictor because that was what got me introduced to Friday the Thirteenth Part Six, or Friday the Thirteenth Part Six introduced me to that, and I guess that was technically the soundtrack, unofficial soundtrack. I mean, pretty much all those songs were in the movies. So. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween, as you said, was, I mean, that's just like one compilation after another of some classic bands. And then outside of horror, I'm going to say 
Prince's Batman soundtrack was another one that I liked. And also, this might catch some people off guard, but another soundtrack I really enjoyed was uh, the movie The Last Action Hero. Oh, that actually had a really good one. It was a really good soundtrack. It had a bunch of heavy metal stuff. It was a spoof on action. And, you know, not really horror, but it it knew it, it was a it was like scary movie before scary movie. And that's what Last Action Hero was, and I think people don't understand that because I actually enjoy Last Action Hero, and I think it's a good movie. I think it's smart, and the soundtrack was really kick ass <laughs> well but that movie i felt like it was ahead of its time before like spoofing was a bigger thing where that one did it at such a straight face like this is what this is but is it what it is i think you're right i think you absolutely nailed it with that because there were times where you know like they were in in the movie <laughs> you know and they just played it off like this is what we do. And then when he gets outside of the movie, it's like, wait a minute, this isn't, you know, like, the car doesn't blow up after I shoot it? No, it's no. Like, My favorite scene in that movie, though, I have to admit, is where he shoots the guy, he starts screaming, I just shot a man! <laughs> <laughs> and the other guy just like, shut up! <laughs> that one actually, yeah, I'll give you that one. That's a really good one. Mm. Even a really good movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're not horror related, but we were talking about like soundtracks and how important they are. I gotta say that. I mean, as far as a horror soundtrack goes in general, I mean, the only thing that comes to my head is Rob Zombie's Halloween. I mean, I've had Rocky Horror, but it's not really horror exactly. Um, I've had the orchestral scores to Sleepy Hollow and Elm Street, but it's not the heavy metal stuff. Yeah. I think actually for like 90s music, the first Scream soundtrack was pretty good. It had like a mix of, like there was a remake of Don't Fear the Reaper and had some of like the pop songs that fit with that time that lets you know that it was like a mid to late 90s sort of movie and makes you feel for like the, like what the teens were into at that time. Because I remember it was kind of like a lot of that bands like Garbage or... I don't know, just the late 90s sort of thing. So I think it was appropriate. It may not be my favorite, but it's definitely good because it fits with that movie and fit with the time. Makes sense. You? Honestly, I've, I've said it multiple times. Rob Zombie <laughs> knows how to do his soundtracks. It's I'm always going to say that because that dude, he's got an ear for music, and it always you can see it in his movies. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just, I'm. He somehow makes it fit. I brought up the scene about um, Motorhead. Alice Cooper scene that always is a chilling scene. So it's like, even the Destroyer kicking in. Well, God of Thunder when they show the house for the first time. So, I feel like his mo He's one of the ones that decides to use it more than others. So I'm curious to see what the monsters is gonna be like. Because I feel like it's going to be a little more orchestral, but it, I feel like he's still going to have that kind of heavy metal feel to it. I think he'll have a couple of them in there. I mean, come on, he has one song called Dragula named yeah. after the fucking car that they have. And I think he had John 5 do um, the theme on one of the Halloween albums. Oh, okay. So it's like... I think John 5 should do the... Monsters theme for this. Yeah. That's a cool theme, too. I know. I love it. That's it, why it's like if you have an argument on what's better, Adam Stanley or the Monsters. Monsters. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Monsters because like, it shows the dynamic of a, um, wow, and almost an outcast family like coming together where Adam's family is a bunch of weirdos that love each other, and it's amazing, but this was always one that kind of like fit better with me. It's more music. I mean, Adam's family is just like a catchy little ditty or yeah. jingle oh. <laughs> i mean it's not bad i'm uh, definitely not bashing on it and it's cool like how some of those songs have become like they're heavy metal versions of that as well i mean yeah. shit the 60s batman show that inspired deep purple space trucking oh really yeah that that came from the yeah that's awesome <laughs> Other than that, I mean, I've listened to soundtracks before 
growing up that I thought were really cool because it introduced you to other bands. Like, believe it or not, Batman Forever soundtrack. That was a memorable one for me. Wait, is it the one with the Kiss on Rose or Kiss by Rose? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it even had that U2 song that was actually like a little bit like heavy metal rocking. I think it's called Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me. It's actually like, wow, this is a U2 song? <laughs> and blow, that blew my mind. <laughs> I feel like it, if they get to use it the right way, it could be fit in anything. Um... Yeah, you're gonna hate this one. The opening to Justice League, the Joss Whedon cut, the song they used actually fits the whole opening. Where, like you said, if you change it, it's not gonna have the same feel to it. Oh, everybody knows. Yeah, yeah, that was actually like more of that song's actually kind of scary. The original one it has like that synthesizer that. Mm, 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 mm. Like I don't know, did you ever hear the original song? No, I I just have the soundtrack for that. It's actually like. <laughs> I mean, it's 80s. It's definitely 80s, but it's it's almost scary in a way. It's actually more of like one of those, like, you know, like how George Carlin said it's a big club and you ain't in it? Yeah. It's basically a song like that, that, like, you know, you know the game's rigged, you know that they, that everything is all fixed and you act like nobody cares and they keep putting on a show that, oh, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that, and it's like, really, yeah, they're like three steps ahead of us, <laughs> And and that's why it's everybody knows. <laughs> that makes sense. Oh, well, even um, in Suicide Squad, they redid Leslie Gore's "You Don't Own Me." Yeah. Or the girl who did it, uh, that remade it. She mixed like a little bit of rap with it, but I have heard an edited version where they take the rap out, and that's pretty solid too. And Leslie Gore's version is really good as well. I just made think of this like so. It seems like the superhero action movies are starting to do it now. Because Suicide Squad, 1 and 2, Birds of Prey. Oh, yeah. uh, Guardians of the Galaxy is a big one. Where oh, plays. hell yeah. That was a, yeah they're, they're, they're basically making a like a second side job <laughs> you know, from the soundtracks there. Bringing the soundtracks back again. And also ma- bringing the nostalgia of making it look like it's a cassette player or something, too, yeah. on the covers of the art. Well, and like we said, the Batman had Nirvana mixed in with there, helped moving the narrative along. But it is kind of nice, like like I said, hearing them do older songs, but update them for the time. Even if it's a new artist, just update it for a different sound. So like you said, the Nirvana song, changing it just enough to give it two different sides. Yeah, because the, the music and the melody is there. Sometimes it just needs to fit a scene with that movie. It's like if somebody says, I really like this song and I think it fits, but this isn't what I think it should be. And somebody will just be like, well, what if we t- tweak it like this? And they do a couple different versions and all of a sudden, boom, it works. You know, like All you got to do is just up the chorus and raise like a more uplifting kind of feeling. And then, boom, you got this like epic trailer, you know? And it goes from like like this like super high to back low again and like really brings you up to go holy shit and then it brings you down to like just mellow you down i've heard that for so many times where they say in songs and one of the guys who i think actually taught kurt cobain said i think was it the beatles or they said if you listen to a lot of their songs they start off really slow and then they pick you up then they bring you back down they pick you up and then they bring you back down again it's like a roller coaster that's pretty cool. And a lot of Nirvana songs were like that when you listen to them. Like Lithium, that starts off really slow and then kicks back up again. Shit. So, it's pretty, pretty neat. Um, pretty wild techniques. I think it's really cool how it's been incorporated and how it's evolved the way it has. Like I can't think of some some horror movies without it. I understand why some don't even fit. Um, like, I, I just don't see Kiss or Alice Cooper or any newer bands fitting in something like The Exorcist. I mean, I think The Exorcist is just fine the way it is. I don't know. Love Gun kicking in when she starts vomiting? I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> there, there is... Oh, you know what? There is w- one movie that I can think of. I don't think it would really help the movie at all, but <laughs> there's a song... At the very beginning, that makes me go, is this the movie I'm like I'm watching? 
is Friday the 13th Part 8. That song when you first see all the Manhattan stuff. What the fuck is that? I remember thinking, is this a Friday movie? I see Fri- I watching? Yeah, I see Friday the 13th pop up on screen. I see Kane Hodder as Jason, and I'm like, this is not setting the mood for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, like, and not that like if, if I put some different song in there that would help it out, but I, oh. I mean, at that point, I think they were still doing the, the, like even in Friday Seven, they were still kind of doing the original Friday intro in a way. Yeah, I know three. They did the three D thing, and but they still would like wouldn't credits would pop up at the beginning they didn't do that with eight like they did for six and seven it's like i, I feel i feel like eight is though the 80s movie if you oh, look at man. everything in that movie that's totally fucking 80s oh yeah well shit you see batman 89 in times square like the put <laughs> like the advertisement is right there <laughs> oh, my gosh. oh yeah, that's definitely 80s to a t i'd actually have to like probably when we do another film asylum episode we watch a movie and go I don't know if this song fit with this scene or that scene. That's when I'll have an idea and pay more attention to it. But yeah, I, woohoo. <laughs> no, I, I just thought of one. The remake of Evil Dead, um, when it's raining blood, you know where I'm going with this? Mm-hmm. I feel like Slayer should have kicked in and probably would have <laughs> been perfect either way. Chainsaw. <laughs> I can't even see heavy metal in a, like an actual zombie movie, like a Night of the Living Dead. Because yeah. I feel like it would wreck the moment yeah because it's like, like a somber thing kind of building up where i think it's in army of the dead they did use a lot of heavier music so it's a newer movie but it wasn't like for a build-up it was more or less like crazy shit's happening with the play um uh, oh shit yeah the soundtrack playing into it the remake of dawn of the dead had a lot of remade songs but but a slower pace mm. so um down with the sickness done by i didn't think his name was richard cheese and he's playing it with oh piano. yeah he's like a that crooner yeah <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> i think doesn't he do the <laughs> it was either him or pat boone that did crazy trade and yeah they're pat boone and richard cheese they're they're like crooners and their songs are very like crazy, but that's how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> like Frank Sinatra type. <laughs> oh my God. But like I said, zombie movies alone, you can probably fit them in like during an attack, but it's not necessary. Like because it's a lot more of a build up. Um, I would say either you might be able to sneak something in, in Dawn of the Dead, like towards the end where they like break through the wall, but not necessary. Day of the Dead, same concept. It wouldn't be until either Land of the Dead or probably like a lot of the New Zombie movies where it's more of a horde. Where uh, it's kind of like building up and then you're kind of getting that crazy fucking moment. That actually reminds me. There's a band out there. They just released a second album. It's called the Zombie EP. The first uh, album was about Outbreak. The second album was about a horde. Yeah. And it's actually really good, but it, like you said, Cookie Monster Sound... Uh, they're called the Devil Wars Prada. And <laughs> they released the second one during the pandemic. <laughs> hey, what else are they going to do during a pandemic? But it was, was kind of cool, like, hearing the build up and everything. Like you said, it built up and then, like, crazy shit's happening. So, <laughs> <laughs> I thought this thing about zombies. I mean, music definitely does play a huge part in, in music. I mean, in movies and any sort of visual medium because it adds more emotional depth to it, whether it's high low good or bad it does create another layer of ambiance it's obviously important because sometimes like i remember them saying that the music really made halloween and i feel like heavy metal especially certain heavy metal obviously fits in with certain horror movies and certain scenes you know i don't think you can just interject any sort of heavy metal but i also see it more as like when you're out in an attraction, like I was talking about Shocktoberfest, for some reason it just seemed like you could put the movies up and if you're socializing or even like at a party and you see like the horror stuff and 
the metal just blaring or anything that has that like horror theme to it because we get that horror theme now i think it just fits like you walk into i don't know like spirit halloween you know and they might have black sabbath or something playing and just like all scary things and it's like yeah i i hear it i feel it it gets you in the mood you know i can't walk in there and listen to Katy perry talking about how she kissed the girl and liked it and feel like oh yeah um this uh leather face mask looks really cool <laughs> wow that was a uh, quite a jump there. <laughs> see what i mean you're laughing at it because it doesn't fit no, I feel like I should ask them. Just, just this... put it. Just put Katy Perry on. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens. It has them trying on Freddy Krueger sweaters. And... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at the theme for our shows. Yeah. Now we use some rocking themes written by John Rochetter and performed by our good friend Sandra Williams. And we see heavy metal even used throughout other places, like when we were talking about WWE and the Attitude Era. Like their intro was metal as hell, you know, and that it, it, it was was attitude you know i mean they made those things where it looked like you were like they would wrestle in a warehouse or something like an abandoned warehouse they probably were (laughs) at times i wouldn't doubt it (laughs) and now it's now it's a little different now it's a little more fun like wrestling themes when they come out if like when triple h started coming out and changing his look to the biker gimmick and it was bad as it was motorhead it was badass and then when it was a little more fun it was dx and that was like a little more of like an uplifting kind of like fun rebellious yeah and that's what they are they're degeneration x was that rage against machine who did that no that was i don't know what the name of that band was they were their own band though. okay i was like the sound sound very similar so <laughs> and the lead singer kind of looked like zach de la roach <laughs> yeah but no i don't think it was them anything else no not really I mean, I think it's a shame that the bands that we have now aren't as talented as what we used to have before, and that a lot of the music that I hear that's mainstream, which isn't saying a whole lot, just doesn't fit in with a lot of movies nowadays. If anything, we hear a lot more older music, even with newer movies. It'll be interesting in where you go. I think we'll still find ways to fit the old classics in with newer stuff here and there, which I think is cool, because... Good songs are just timeless. Oh, absolutely. And good ideas, just when they fit, they fit. Well then, I guess we'll end it on that note. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Well, that was our episode of Jeff and Colin in the Morning, the heavy metal and horror mix edition, (laughs) if you want to call it that. And with that being said, we shall sign off. This is Colin Peters. And Jeff Manfred. Thank you all once again for listening. Stay safe. Stay great. Uh, please somebody help me! Oh yeah.